It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Café Web Talk time. Our Space Café Web Talk 33 minutes with Professor Geraldine Go Escolar will begin soon. Thank you very much for joining us for our talk today about blockchain and the space industry when two revolutions, worlds collide. So as always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of spacewatch.global and we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and the new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. So our latest episode released hours ago today features one of Europe's hottest projects, clean space. And we talked with Luc Piguet about TOTAC tow trucks in space. Super interesting and I'm quite sure we will link back to that later in our talk. And for all our fans of audio content, we started with Space Cafe Radio, where we talk with interesting people on the road, on shows, on conferences. And the first episodes are online on our website, such as Emma Gatti's miniseries about the Amadi 20 analog Mars mission in the Israeli desert. And next week at our Space Tech Expo Bremen, we will record a, a number of our more Space Cafe radio shows for you. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher by getting your uh, by, the, by getting you a T-shirt. You help us to continue our work. And if you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the events section and on YouTube. So today is a very special day for me, for us that are in or from Berlin, and that's where I'm uh, broadcasting from. Today, we celebrate the 32nd anniversary of the Berlin Wall falling as well, two systems and a co collision. Not sure if that adds on to our program, but um, it's something that's very important, at least for me, otherwise I wouldn't be here and do this wonderful show. So my guest today is one of the great people in our industry that have a say. She is one of those that you better listen to very carefully. And I'm so delighted to have her on my show today. A very warm welcome, Professor Geraldine Go Escolar. For all of you that doesn't know Geraldine, she is an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore, where she teaches international space law. But she's also first secretary of the Hag Conference on Private International Law, and she specializes in the intersection of technology, policy, and law, building eff effective solutions to the, to the challenges our communities face by leveraging new technologies and the legal and policy resources available at the international and transnational level. And Jer Jerry's work focuses on entrepreneurial and social impact opportunities that can be designed, implemented and iterated with an eye towards long term sustainability and inclusive dialogue at the international level. And this is all beyond impressive, I have to say. And so I had to read it out word by word. Again, Gary, welcome to our show today. Thanks so much, Torsten. Hello, welcome everyone. And thanks for taking the time to come listen on, on to this uh, Space Cafe. It's lovely to be here. And we have a very full house. So, I mean, it's it's pretty good to see that people um, want to listen to this very important topic. So, and it might sound today like an education just for me, but before we start diving into this topic, can you please help us to understand a few basics which are i think mixed and matched are uh, in in our talks not in our talks or not in your talks but in the general talks. so on the blockchain what is the distributed ledger technology bitcoin how does mining fit into that just to give us some briefing on that 
Sure, of course, Dorsten. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, first, my caveat is I am actually a lawyer, so I'm not a coder or a programmer. And so I will try to explain it in terms that at least I understood. And um, over the last few months and years that I've been working in this space, I've realized that for a lot of people, when you mention distributed ledger technology or DLT, immediately the mind jumps to blockchain and from there to Bitcoin and from there to mining and then from there to the various different implications that that uh, that comes to um, and so let's maybe take a step back uh, and start with the actual technology the like the the DLT or the distributed ledger technology is a very specific kind of technology and this is a digital system um, that records the transaction of assets in which transactions and their de details of those transactions are recorded in multiple places or multiple nodes at the same time. So unlike traditional databases, um, distributed ledgers, like their name says, are distributed, that there is no central data store or administration functionality, um, which means that in a distributed ledger, each location or each node would verify and would process every item that comes in. And it generates a, a list of a record of each item um, now, each of these nodes then creates uh, what is called a consensus, uh, verifying that specific item. And of course, then a distributed ledger, this technology can be used to record data. So it could become a registry. Uh, it also could record data that moves, so dynamic data. Um, such as when you have, for example, a transaction. So when you have a contract or when you have a specific financial transaction. Now, the DLT then refers to the technological infrastructure, the framework that allows this to happen simultaneously. That means that you can have access, you can validate, you can uh, change your record, you can not change, you can update rather the records. Uh, and that's what characterizes this specific technology. It is also spread across a bunch of different entities and locations, and that's why it is distributed. Now, what's special about this is that because of the way it is, it creates what's called an immutable database, which means that once the information goes up onto this database and it's stored, it cannot be deleted, and any updates to that data is permanently recorded. And this is actually a big change uh, in terms of data recording, uh, in terms of how information is gathered and communicated. So from instead of keeping a record on one single location that's authoritative, it then becomes a system that is very decentralized so that everybody can look at this ledger, everybody can change this ledger, but everything is recorded so that everybody can see this. So that's actually DLT. Now, what's special about DLT then is that it kind of eliminates um, errors in the process. Uh, it makes it easier because it's less time consuming to reconcile different inputs to this ledger. And so the accuracy can be trusted without going through a third party trusted intermediary. So that's DLT. Now what's blockchain? Now you always see those two used together. Now, simply put, blockchain is one type, Be one type of many DLTs. May, may, may Sorry, Torsten, yeah. Yeah, uh, something is clicking on your end. So uh, oh, I mean, I, I see how enthusiastic you are on it, but I think <laughs> you're hammering on your microphone. <laughs> okay, I'm try not to touch so my mic, sorry. Uh, <laughs> is it better now? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> thank, um, thank you, Dominic, for pointing that. <laughs> thanks, Dominic. Sorry for that. Um, so blockchain then um, is basically one kind of DLT. So it's not it's no basically blockchain is a DLT, but not all DLT is blockchain. If, if that makes sense. So it basically blockchain is one. Uh, how would you say one type of. Um, of DLT and the other types. So for example, there are hash graphs and in hash graph, multiple transactions are stored on the ledger with the same timestamp uh, and are stored in a parallel structure. And that's not in the chain structure, uh, the way blockchain is. Uh, there is tempo or radix, and that's also different uh, because the items are added on the ledger in order of the event rather than order of the timestamp. There are others, there are, there are DAGs and you know, hollow chains and so on. So basically point is blockchain is just the one application of, um, the, um, of DLT. 
Does, does that make sense? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Good. Let's move slowly forward. <laughs> Why are space and blockchain, if we take blockchain as one of the applications out of distributed ledger technologies, two worlds, or as we described it, two revolutions? And yeah, why why are they potentially collide? Um, that's a really good question, Torsten. I think the the easiest way to look at it is perhaps the history of uh, yeah. of these two industries uh, and space. The truth of it is it started as a military strategic um, space, it still is, uh, but its origin was really rooted in military dominance uh, and therefore it's very governmental based. It's very um, you know, stuck in the authority of traditional government state-centric systems. Blockchain on the other hand um, and DLT uh, started a bit with this idea that we don't want to have that trusted third party, so that authoritative figure that would run all of the things from the top-down approach. So the idea is to kind of democratize um, this access. And it's interesting because blockchain or DLT, as well as space activities, all have one thing in common, and that is they break down the artificial borders that we draw in policy, legal, geographic terms, which is the borders between countries. By its very nature, space activities, as well as activities on the ledger, are basically transfrontier. And so when you think about it that way, there is this paradox there where you have two different worlds that started with, in that sense, almost a posit um, origins, and they're coming together as they as basically there's a lot that overlap, uh, and these two technologies function together, um, and also because by their very physical nature, they are actually trans frontier. So that's the reason why I think there are two worlds are coming together. They might collide. They might pass like two ships in the night, and we could talk about this for a very long time. But I think today we'll probably only touch uh, on the surface of the debate that we're going to have. Wonderful. Thank you very much for setting the scene for us uh, and, and giving us this, this, this background information. So what is your 10,000 feet view on use cases and new developments of, and in this case, blockchain in space? Because we will then have another question about space and blockchain. So, but this way, blockchain in space applications and yeah, what are their legal implications? I mean, having a lawyer in the room, that's that's an unavoidable question, of course. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to make people leave the room. Um, but I think I think before we uh, really settle into that, if you don't mind, Torsten, I think there are certain things that we need to have a mindset change about. Um, and the first question is when to use DLT and when not to use DLT. Um, because DLT ultimately is one tool that solves problems. And what we don't want to do is to create more problems pretending to solve a problem. Uh, and so it's really important, I think, to first have an understanding uh, about what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And once the problem is defined, um, and then we can ask the question, is DLT a solution to the problem? And is it the best solution to the problem? So I think this is quite important. Uh, and I think there was actually very good work done uh, at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, actually close to where you are. Um, and it's Carl Wurst and Arthur Gervais who, who actually came up with a whole flow chart to ask questions, when should you or should you not use DLT? Um, so the point is you only use DLT when the benefits are required to solve the solution because otherwise it's very inefficient and can be very wasteful um, to just create like a, a new solution, which means that they're looking at three things in space activities where because of these three issues, we might want to consider DLT. And the first is whether disintermediation is something that's important. So whether when you cut out the trusted third party, you actually increase your overall efficiency. The second thing is where there might be cross jurisdiction. So where it is not possible to find or create a trusted third party uh, or where it's too inefficient to do that, then you might want to do the DLT. 
And the third thing is to do with actually compliance reporting, um, especially when it comes to regulatory compliance reporting. Um, and you can actually move to a continuous consensus reporting through blockchains and permissionless uh, systems rather than through the traditional things that we're used to. So we need to consider all of this. And after considering all of this, if we decide that DLT uh, is a good thing, uh, for the space industry, then no, absolutely, we should do, use DLT. So I think your specific question then, sorry, Torsten, for the mm -hmm. uh, background, um, is the use cases of blockchain or DLT in space. And that we actually see quite a few things. Um, the, the first one is quite interesting, and it's basically the supply manufacturing chain. So one possibility is to use it in supply chains to track resources during, for example, asteroid or uh, celestial body mining, uh, and to manage large space construction projects. Um, that's also easy to use on the on the distributed ledger. Uh, easy one to use, for example, is uh, asset tokenization. So quite interestingly, I think in 2018, uh, planetary resources which as we all know is an asteroid mining company was acquired by consensus and consensus is a major blockchain company and a lot of people said that um, that might show that um, there is a prediction that blockchain will support the asteroid mining process by tokenizing the assets there uh, tokenization is uh, to basically digital, digital, digitalize physical assets so it can be stored on a blockchain database. Um, and so that might be one way to do it. And now interesting thing of course is space debris because currently there isn't a real public database uh, of all the debris that we have, all the satellites that we have. Uh, there is one of course, which is owned by the United States Air Force. Um, and so it might be interesting as well to have a decentralized database of all the debris in orbit, um, which is on the ledger. It allows for a neutral, very um, neutral place uh, for getting positions of satellites and so on. So um, there are these things that you can do. Um, one other really interesting thing is the financing of space projects through blockchain or through crypto or through the DLT system, which is interesting because it removes the intermediary. So if we, instead of funding space startups or space companies through in, uh, initial public offerings or IPOs, we do it through ICOs, which are initial coin offerings, or we do it through cryptocurrency, it removes the intermediary. And that allows basically anybody to buy into the investment in the space economy. So all you need basically is to set up your own crypto wallet change your fiat currency into cryptocurrency and start making things on the chain. Uh, that might be one way to democratize space finance, may not be the best way, but it is one way. Uh, another possibility is to have what's called a decentralized autonomous organization uh, run the space financing and any sort of profit that come back from the space activity uh, so that it's decentralized and is democratized in terms of how these profits can be split uh, among the investors without the third party. Now, this, of course, raises quite a few legal questions, as Torsten, you mentioned. Um, you know, one of the biggest issues, of course, is that there are different regulatory regimes or none at all when it comes to cryptocurrency and this sort of things, ICOs and so on, the coin offerings. Uh, and there we're actually working on this sort of issues in private international law um, and the question of the conflict of laws, because the traditional connecting factors that show you which laws are applicable, which jurisdiction would be the best forum, um, you know, that sort of thing, how you recognize and enforce these sort of decisions, they don't apply anymore when there's no geographic link to quite a lot of these uh, transactions. So that's one serious problem. The other issue, of course, is that if we start to um, use DLT everywhere, we must make sure that our laws are actually technology neutral and so that we regulate the applications rather than a specific technology because as the technology evolves, um, we need to be sure that those regulatory mechanisms still apply. So there are quite a few legal issues here. Um, and when you take all that in the context of the Outer Space Treaty and the other public international law frameworks, uh, we start to run into this interesting issue of how do we reconcile democratization with this very state-centric Westphalian idea that is the United Nations Space Treaties. Okay. 
So if we turn that around now, what are concrete examples or use cases or so cases of space in blockchain? And again, their legal implications. Yeah, no, that's, that's of course then interesting because it's the flip way around, right? So how do we use space um, in the, the digital or the crypto economy? Um, one of the use cases that we've seen come up is the use of satellites as nodes in the chain. So remember the, the distributed ledger technology uh, relies on these locations, these distributed nodes to pass data around and to verify transactions. Um, one of the things of course is to use satellites as participating nodes, either to store the data or to validate the, 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 the uh, transaction or to add data. Um, and then you basically use the satellite to receive and store. And actually JP Morgan, together as well with some other companies like Blockstream, Space Chain, they've actually started to um, launch this sort of satellites into space. Uh, and these satellites can actually create a closed circuit verification system that does not require the internet. So we don't need the internet anymore uh, to get involved with the crypto economy. All these things can happen on the satellite constellation themselves. Now, what is the most obvious legal um, uh, um, implication, of course, is the question of jurisdiction, um, jurisdiction control, responsibility, and liability. Um, when we look at it, actually, in particular, from satellites, and the easiest things to go back to the Outer Space Treaty and the Registration Convention of the United Nations, registration and control are linked. Um, and basically the state that has that space object on their national registries are the ones that have then jurisdiction over that, sub, uh, that, that object. Which means that that could become one area, one possible area of farm shopping where you choose basically which jurisdiction you want and you register your satellite on that specific registry. Uh, and we need laws and considerations, policies to um, think about that basically um, and see what we can do about that. So we know, for example, Space Chain, uh, they use blockchain technology to advance space exploration. That, that's the idea of that company. Um, and um, this Space Chain in particular was founded by Adam Back, I think. And uh, this, the idea is the network of satellite would allow anyone anywhere on the planet to transact, uh, transact in Bitcoin. So that's one use case that we see uh, quite often now um, in, in outer space for blockchain. Um, I would like to bring in Mark's question here immediately as you as you use this term of forum, forum shopping. So mm -hmm. how can we avoid that? And I know that is a very naive question uh, at that stage. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's a very good point because um, that is a, a basic question of private international law, right? So in when we have a conflict of laws, so when we want to see, okay, I don't know which jurisdiction would apply to a specific transaction or a person or, 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 a, or an action, um, we usually have these things called connecting factors and they're usually traditional. So what is the closest connection and the location um, of you know, location where the asset is, uh, you know, the location where the law is, you know, so we have these things called, for example, lex situs, which is the law that is where the thing is located is the law that applies. Um, those things don't work anymore. Uh, and so today there's a lot of consideration of what's going to happen um, with that. And so I'm sorry for Mark, but there's no specific uh, answer to that at the moment, but it is being considered in various different fora. Um, the organization for which um, I, I work, the Hague Conference of Private International Law is looking at this, um, on this question of jurisdiction, applicable law um, in terms of the digital economy. Uh, and we're working together with UNIDWA, who looks at the harmonization of uh, private international law rules and UNCITRAL the uh, United Nations Commission on International Trade and Development to actually see how we can solve this issue. There is no good answer uh, at the moment, but we're working on it. Okay. Mark is used by the way that we can't answer all his questions oh, that good. he comes, comes <laughs> up with. So, so <laughs> he doesn't take it personally. That's good. Okay. Okay. So having now set these, these two directions of Bitcoin in space, space in Bitcoins, uh, not Bitcoin, sorry, digital ledger technologies. Can you describe a few interesting trends for us that you see ar arising on the ho horizon? Because it seems that it can be a potential big wave, 
and we have on the other side the, 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 the space wave that is rolling mm -hmm. over us. Uh, so, and as we know from waves, if they go orthogonal, we have nice or uh, nice circles in the water. But if they are aligned to each other, then they make a mega wave. So, <laughs> where are we right now here? Oh, that, that's a really good question, Torsten. Um, and I think when we think about trends, I think the, the first thing that is an obvious trend to me is um, these two fields are going to intersect. Um, you know, they're on a conjunction path and they're going to intersect. Now, whether it's a massive collision or they learn to merge together is basically the junction at which we stand. And I think how we work in the policy, strategy, and legal, as well as economical considerations will define how we go forward. Um, and why do I say that? I think the first trend essentially is when we have the opposite origins of the space economy uh, versus DLT, so really military government space versus DLT, decentralized economy based and, and so on. Uh, when these two things collide, either we're gonna find a happy medium or we're going to end up with regulatory regimes that will try to squash um, the decentralization. So we'll take away the great benefit of this technology. Um, now, legally and policy-wise, I don't think that's um, a good thing. I think we need to sit down and really think how to make these two mesh together. And I don't think it's impossible. I think it's difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. Uh, why? We've seen in the last few years, basically, um, a lot of participation, um, which includes a greater swath of um, participants, so more diversity, great, greater access to uh, people who want to speak to stakeholders, to individuals, to you and me. Um, you know, 50 years ago, this conversation we're having wouldn't have happened, it, it, you know, not certainly online, not for everybody to access, to us access to the internet. So I think that will, that will be quite interesting. So that trend is, is there, they're coming together. Um, also because the technology is there and it's a matter of time before people learn to mesh them together, which then leads me to the second trend, which I think mm -hmm. is going to happen, uh, which is the possibility that we might democratize access to space and to the financial economy by meshing these two revolutions together. Um, the interaction of space and blockchain and the technology itself is very neutral, but the application of the technology is the thing that we want to be worried about. Technology never is, in my opinion, moral or immoral, good or bad. It's the application and the implementation of that technology that we can decide which way it goes. And I think now we stand at that junction as well to decide, um, do we want to leverage it for good? If we want to do so, we should take a kind of step back, like you said, the 10,000 foot view and look at how the policy and legal framework today and tomorrow can push it in the correct direction. So we leverage it for good. We allow it to democratize access, um, access to the financial economy, mm -hmm. access to the global economy, access to the space economy, because that's what the distributed ledger technology can do for the new space economy. And then the last thing, of course, is when we're thinking about all this, so beyond ourselves and how much money we can put in each other's pockets, um, is the environmental issue. And this is something that's very close to my heart. We just had COP26 um, and we wanna look at basically um, this, this question. Now, a lot of people are looking at DLT, thinking Bitcoin and thinking this mining costs a lot of energy. Yeah, it's not good for the planet and being worried about greenwashing. And well, we should be, we should be worried about this, but I think we also need to think about how we can incorporate climate protection, sustainability considerations uh, into both the space economy and the blockchain economy and the interaction between the two. And if we have the policy discussions now, I think we are actually in a very good state. Now, firstly, we've had 40 years of discussion after Rio about environmental considerations. It was something that we didn't have at the time we started the space economy back in 67. So it was only after 1982 and after Rio that we started thinking about the planet as really an ecosystem we want to protect uh, our children and their children as stakeholders in the environmental consideration. And as we move forward with technology and imp implementing technologies in each field, whether space and blockchain or blockchain and space, we need to also then consider from a bird's eye view, what is the environmental consideration and how can we do this to protect our environment. A lot of questions I know, Torsten, um, and I wish I had lots of answers to them, but I think the, the one big 
answer that becomes quite clear to me is that because we have the benefit of hindsight now, we know what environment will be like. We have science that tells us about the two degree increase, you know, about everything that will happen with climate change. I think we need to now sit and pause and really think about the implications, legal, policy, economy, um, strategic wise, of our actions in space using blockchain and space and how all these three can intersect. But we need a regulatory mechanism that calls us accountable to this. So those are the three trends that I see. I see more and more support for this, especially in our younger, um, you know, our younger partners and stakeholders, the younger generation. And I think these are the trends that, whether we like it or not, will push the, the whole revolution forward. Absolutely, and that, I mean, it just blew my mind what you what you just laid out. And I I would love to go into into the details. And I know we are, will crash our thirty three minutes uh, by that. So um, promise to the to the audience we will follow up on that, and we will think about having a separate, maybe a separate series um, just on our on the technologies and in the space in the space sector. So give us some some time on that, but. Thank you very much for, for, for these trends. One immediate response to that or hearing all of that is who shall, because there is nobody who does it today, but who shall own this debate, this, this fora, this discussion on these topics finally? Because obviously the worlds are not in line or the, the revolutions are not in line on that. Oh, you ask difficult right. questions, Thorsten. Uh, so I think, you know, that question, who shall own the debate, um, implies maybe two assumptions that I would like to unpack. The first is that the debate has to be owned. And I think that's really important. Um, it is important that the debate must be owned because only with ownership comes accountable um, responsibility. Uh, and accountability and responsibility to responsibility is very important. Now, who shall own it is very different than who will own it or who, you know, so who should as opposed to who will own it. Um, and I think today um, we do have something quite special, which is that we have the ability to allow more vulnerable or people with a smaller voice um, to take a stake in owning the debate. Yeah. So in, in a way that we didn't have 100, 200 years ago, where it was really just a few voices in the room, you always hear the same voices mm -hmm. in an echo chamber. Um, right now, nobody really does own the debate. But because so many people are interested and because it is actually so democratized, I think it's really important that the people who want something good for the for this planet, for, for these two spaces, step up and take ownership of the debate. Now, it's easy to say, of course, what does it mean? Does it mean the UN will discuss, uh, discuss it? Does it mean it's between states? Is it regional? Um, it could be any of that, and it could be, be all of, of your, that. Be aware of your microphone. <laughs> oh, again, yeah, I have to hold it. It's the problem. I'm going to hold it so it doesn't fall. Uh, sorry for that. But I think it could be anybody. And um, and so even at the United Nations, what we've seen over the last 50, 100 years is the movement of vulnerable minorities and people, individuals like you and me, from objects to actual subjects uh, of international law, where we're given a voice uh, and it's a matter of us to stand up and take it. Uh, some individuals have done so, uh, you know, the, the easy name that comes to mind after last week is Greta Thunberg, um, you know, obviously the people that step up and, and, you know, step to the mic and do this. Now, I think that as more people do this, this, this will become something that happens more often. And with that, it means that more people are educated. Um, it also prevents people from being, say, scammed, you know, with the wolves being pulled over their eyes. And so I don't have, again, I'm sorry, I wish I had a good answer to this. Um, who should own the debate? I think we all should, but certainly people ought to step up and take ownership of it rather than leave it, um, you know, hoping that uh, that somebody else will. Before we try to answer a few of the questions, and I know it's it's just the attempt to, to give an answer here. Um, a very personal question, hearing about all of that, what you said before, and knowing that you you work in this field day by day so do you think humanity will master it the technology or will we just make a few more people even richer than they are before um that's a really good question 
I want to say, yes, I believe humanity will master it. I also want to say, yes, along the way, there are people who are going to be, who are rich, who are going to be richer. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a terrible thing, as long as that's not the end of it. Hmm. Um, it also means that the, it's really important that as humanity as a whole, we educate ourselves, we educate other people, um, and people are allowed to learn and, and to contribute on the basis of their learning or our learning uh, to the conversation. It might make some rich people even richer. Uh, and in the short term, it looks like that's going to be the case. Uh, if you follow Twitter and a sudden conversation that's going on about uh, paying taxes and, uh, and, and cryptocurrencies and, and so on, you'll see some people are going to get a lot richer. Some people are going to be basically wiped out. Uh, as these whales start to circle, uh, circle, but as more people are aware of, of these things, I'm I'm hoping that this means that we're going to move to you know pivot at least to conversation in the correct direction. Wonderful. There's there are a few remarks in the in the chat. Uh, where can people find more content from you and about the uh, material and, and reading contract? So if mm -hmm. we if you just send it over to me, we put it then in our thank you email and and distribute it with with our audience if that's if that's possible. But let's take uh, two of these these questions here. Um, really with the with the request for a short answer because our production team already raised a <laughs> yellow, <laughs> dark yellow flag. So um, Olivier or Oliver Mosseau, um, uh, so how will the tokenizing of assets minded in space work considering the uncertainty of recognizing of property rights in outer space? Right. Um, that's that's a great uh, question, Oliver. Um, so what he's referring to, I, I think, is Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, which does not allow the appropriation of, uh, of objects or things in outer space. There's been a long debate about this, and it's, it's an hour-long easy uh, debate. But the question basically is, can you own something in outer space? So can you own parts of the moon? Can you own parts of a, sat of a, of a artificial satellite, an asteroid? Now, the conventional wisdom is that you can't, because um, if you can't appropriate, states cannot appropriate it, then the question is, who devolves property rights onto private entities, right? Mm -hmm. So if you and I own a piece of land somewhere, like if you own something in Berlin, is because you have a sheet of paper that when you go to the cadastre says it is yours, that's the title deeds, and who gave that to you? In principle, the sovereign, uh, so the state. And if the state itself cannot appropriate something, the question is, can a private entity do so? And this actually gets much more complicated when we're talking about tokenization. Um, for example, NFTs, when you buy a non-fungible token, of an artwork, you don't actually buy the physical artwork, you buy a component of the digitized token that is that artwork. Uh, it's a completely different way of looking at property rights. Um, and so that's a very good question for the reason that we're still exploring what that means when we're tokenizing space assets. Would it actually help um, then to get around Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty in the sense of not kind of like getting rid of the prohibition, but by saying, okay, look, we have all these property in outer space, we tokenize it, everybody has a share on this on this token, everybody can have a token. Um, but um, this becomes the, in that sense, a decentralized um, autonomous organization that allows the equitable sharing mm -hmm. of benefits from space activities. Is that one way forward? Could well be. Um, and that's what's so exciting about this. And it leaves us room for going into this uh, discussion or uh, on another occasion so the last question are <laughs> before we're kicked out here um, with cryptocurrency the uh, and that's from uh, dominic hayes um with cryptocurrency the cost slash effect of making changes across a very large number of nodes is the obstacle to false records would that work for a space debris database question mark yeah, um, Dominic, thanks for the thanks for the question. That's a really good question. It's actually one of the um, use cases uh, to make a database for space debris, and not just space debris, but actually the orbital positions of all satellites. Um, we don't have a comprehensive database. Um, the one that we are aware of that is the most comprehensive is owned by a sovereign nation. 
Um, and of course, as it is in international policy, there are other sovereign nations that may or may not trust this specific sovereign nation. Uh, and there are questions about you know, reliability, trustworthiness, uh, all that. And that is removed uh, by the use of a decentralized database like the distributed ledger technology. Um, and so, yes, I, I think that that might be one possible way forward, not just for a space debris laid database, but also for satellite database, which would become much more important in the near future when we start to have mega constellations. So we have 30,000, 40,000 satellites at one shot owned by someone. Um, would you like to trust that operator of the 40,000 satellites to tell you where they are and what's happening with each of them? Or would you like the data on a distributed ledger that people can actually check on the immutability of that data? And I think you know there is a certain answer there uh, that we have to give um, on the leverage of that technology. I hope it answers the question. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm afraid that we have to come to an end, or but again, it's just the beginning of or definitely more um, to talk about that. And I would like to continue even today with this super inspiring talk, but we can't. So before we finish for today, do not miss our, our next week's our Space Cafe 33 Minutes, and we will be do this live from the Space Tech Expo in Bremen, where myself and our, our team, our editor-in-chief, our event coordinator and our production team will be. So, and I have the great pleasure to talk with Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund, the new president of the ISU, about our, yeah, her upcoming visions for that. And it will be online. No, it is online on Eventbrite. Um, already, we have more planned, so don't be don't be scared. So uh, it's not the end. Uh, there are more uh, events planned for November and December. So um, as always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, and LinkedIn. And I'm quite sure this topic is so rich to give us your feedback. So also please don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you need, uh, if you like, not if you need, if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher today and your support will help us. So take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. It can't be easier for you. Thank you very much, Geraldine, uh, for this inspiring talk and being my guest. And Thanks to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job uh, week by week again. So I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy, especially with this new wave coming over Europe right now. And thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next week. Hope to see you maybe in, in Bremen. And in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become the Space Watcher, Geraldine. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Dorsten. It was, it was such wonderful. a pleasure.